Hello, everyone. My name is Sheikha Dunyo, and I am the direction, Director of Education Programs at NORD, and I'll be your host for today's webinar on specialty pharmacies. This webinar is a part of a free series of educational webinars for patients and caregivers. We are so glad that you are able to join us today, and we hope you join us for future webinars in this series. We'd like to thank our um, supporter, Strongbridge Biopharma, for making this webinar possible today. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a brief minute to uh, talk to you a little bit about NORD for those who are not familiar with us. NORD is an independent organization that's leading the fight to improve the lives of those with rare diseases. We do this through education, research, advocacy, and patient services. You can learn more about our programs, services, and resources, and how to get involved on our website, rarediseases.org. We offer a number of programs that can help you along your journey. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter if you're on social media. So now that I have that out of the way, I would like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Sheila Arquette. She is the Executive Director at the National Association of Specialty Pharmacy. In addition to specialty pharmacy, she has extensive experience in retail pharmacy, hospital pharmacy, long-term care counseling and dispensing, as well as managed care, pharmacy benefit management operations, and more. She is a regular speaker and participant at national pharmacy conferences, roundtables, and industry meetings. Sheila was elected to the NAS Board of Directors and received the NAS Distinguished Service Award in September 2016. Our next speaker is Michael Ziglinski. He is the Senior Vice President of Specialty Pharmacy at OptumRx and is the Chief Executive Officer for Briova Rx Specialty Pharmacy which is a full-service pharmacy focused on patient-centric specialty pharmacy services, um, and their customer base is, are patients, providers, payers, and pharmaceutical manufacturers. Michael brings over 25 years of pharmacy distribution and specialty pharmacy experience, and he leads the division strategy, sales, product development, clinical programs, and analytics. He oversees the operations of 18 specialty pharmacies nationwide. Sheila, I will turn it over to you now. Take it away. Thank you so much, Sheikha, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present to your listeners today. So as Sheikha said, I am a pharmacist by training, and currently I am the Executive Director for the National Association of Specialty Pharmacy, or NASP. So who is NASP? Well, we are the only national trade association representing all stakeholders in the specialty pharmacy industry. NASP is committed to educating and advocating on behalf of its multi-stakeholder membership to ensure that specialty patients receive the highest quality patient care services from the pharmacy of their choosing, and also to transform the delivery of specialty health care through active engagement by improving the patient experience, optimizing clinical outcomes, and by fostering the education and certification of pharmacists who are focused on specialty drug and specialty disease management. NASP provides an online education center with over 45 continuing pharmacy education programs. We host an annual conference every year um, and expo that offers educational sessions and continuing education credits, and we are the only organization that offers a certification program for specialty pharmacists. Our members include the nation's leading independent specialty pharmacies, pharmaceutical and biotechnology manufacturers, group purchasing organizations, patient advocacy groups, integrated delivery systems and health plans, technology and data management vendors, wholesalers, distributors, and practicing pharmacists. And it's important to remember that not all NASP members are pharmacists. However, they all touch the specialty pharmacy patient along the patient care journey in some way. So as we start to talk about specialty pharmacy and we look at the past, the present, and the future, it's important to talk about what is a specialty drug. A universal definition of specialty medication or specialty drug has yet to be accepted and adopted across the industry. And defining the term specialty drug can be quite a challenge. 
The FDA, CMS, employers, health plans, and PBMs have their own ways of defining this fastest growing drug category. When asked by CMS and Congressional Office staff to define a specialty drug, NASP focused on the word complexity. Specialty drugs are more complex than most prescription medications and are used to treat patients with serious and often life-altering and sometimes life-threatening conditions. Specialty medications may be taken orally, but often they must be injected or infused and have special administration, storage, or delivery requirements. So the complexity of a specialty medication may be due to the drug itself, the way it's administered, the management of its side effect profile, the disease or the condition it's used to treat, special access conditions required by the manufacturer, payer authorization or benefit requirements, patient financial hardship, or any combination of these. And as a result, patients being treated with specialty medications require comprehensive patient care, clinical management, and product support services. So as we look to the specialty pharmacy trends, each year the specialty pharmaceuticals market share has grown and it continues to grow. The number of specialty medications has increased fueled not only by approvals in more common specialty diseases such as oncology and hepatitis, but also in rare or orphan diseases as well. Specialty growth has slowed since the hep C bubble burst, but still remains in the double digits. And what I'm talking about um, when I say the hep C bubble, this refers to the period of time when the new oral and much better tolerated hepatitis C drugs, whose cost averaged about $1,000 per pill, were approved by the FDA. And there was a concerted effort by the CDC to have all the baby boomers tested for hep C, and they wanted them to be treated. And as a result, payers saw a surge in the demand for these medications like they have never seen before. So today, the average cost of a specialty medication is approximately $3,500 to $4,500 per patient per month. And by 2022, it is estimated that specialty drugs will account for almost 50% of the pharmacy industry's projected total dispensing revenue, 50%. So as orange as the new black, I like to say that specialty pharmacy is becoming the new pharmacy. So what is a specialty pharmacy? Specialty pharmacy is a state licensed pharmacy that solely or largely provides only medications for people with serious health conditions requiring complex therapy. These include conditions such as cancer, hepatitis C, rheumatoid arthritis, HIV or AIDS, multiple sclerosis, cystic fibrosis, organ transplantation, uh, hemophilia, and other bleeding disorders. So in addition to being state licensed and regulated, most specialty pharmacies are accredited by an independent third party, such as URAC or the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, ACHC, or the Joint Commission. And this accreditation ensures consistent quality of care. Specialty pharmacies connect patients who are severely ill with the medications that are prescribed to their conditions. They provide the patient care services that are required for these medications, and they support patients who are facing insurance coverage and affordability challenges for these medications. Specialty pharmacies provide services that include training on how to use these complex medications, comprehensive treatment assessment, patient monitoring, and frequent communication with caregivers and the patient's physician or other healthcare providers that are involved in the management of this patient. The expert services that specialty pharmacies provide drive adherence and compliance, proper management of medication dosing and side effects, and they ensure appropriate medication use. The specialty pharmacy's patient-centric model is designed to provide a comprehensive and coordinated model of care for patients with these chronic illnesses and complex medical conditions. Specialty pharmacies also help them to achieve superior clinical and economic outcomes and expedite patient access to care. I like to tell folks that a high-performing specialty pharmacy operates at the intersection of the five Ps, the patient, the prescriber, the payer, the drug pipeline, and the pharmaceutical manufacturer. As you can see, the specialty pharmacy channel size and scope is increasingly complex. And this slide just shows all of the different touch points as um, a specialty drug leaves the manufacturer on the left hand and makes its way to the patient over on the right hand side of the slide. Everyone wants to be a specialty pharmacy or be part of this ever changing and evolving industry. From employers to health plans, to pharmacy benefit managers, to grocers, to hospital systems, 
to the accreditation organizations that we just talked about, to technology and data management vendors and GPOs, wholesalers, and distributors. All of these stakeholders are battling for control of that specialty patient and that specialty patient journey. Well, if we look to the evolution of specialty pharmacy practice, where, where did specialty pharmacy start? In its infancy, specialty pharmacy truly was a niche industry serving a limited number of patients with a small number of high-cost, low-volume conditions such as hemophilia and Gaucher's disease. Specialty pharmacies have their roots in the 1970s when they began delivering temperature-controlled drugs to treat cancer, HIV, infertility, and hemophilia. Specialty pharmacies came into existence as a result of unmet needs. As more drugs became available for patients to administer or inject themselves, and as insurers sought to manage access and expenses for patients with these chronic conditions. As the market demanded specialization in drug distribution and the clinical management of these complex therapies, specialty pharmacy has evolved. Manufacturers have increasingly relied on these pharmacies for medications that require special handling or have potentially dangerous side effects, and for those medications that require a comprehensive, coordinated patient care management program. In the mid-1990s, there were fewer than 30 specialty drugs. By 2008, this number had increased to 200, and today there are well over 400. There are also close to 800 pharmacies with specialty pharmacy accreditation, and this is the criterion that we use when we are asked to quantify um, the number of specialty pharmacies um, that are in operation today. So the goals of a specialty pharmacy are to ensure the appropriate use of medications, to maximize drug adherence, to enhance patient satisfaction through direct interaction with healthcare professionals, to minimize the cost impact, and to optimize pharmaceutical care outcomes in the delivery of health information. So as we think about specialty pharmacy, well, what else is there that makes specialty pharmacy so special? As I previously mentioned, manufacturers have historically partnered with specialty pharmacy to dispense medications that require special handling or have potentially dangerous side effects, and also to dispense care to those who require this comprehensive and coordinated patient care management um, style. There are approximately 7,000 rare diseases that affect 25 to 30 million people in the United States, more than half of whom are children, but treatments are only available for a very small percentage of them. Many of these diseases are life-threatening or life-limiting, and while some conditions can now be treated and managed as chronic conditions, for the first time, new curative treatments are bringing the promise of a better life to some patients. The creation of the U.S. Orphan Drug Act of 1983 facilitated development and approval of drugs for rare diseases, such as Huntington's disease, ALS, and muscular dystrophy. The years 2017 and 2018 were marked by the highest number of orphan drug and indication approvals since the passage of the Orphan Drug Act. The combination of scientific advances along with accelerated product review and a growing commitment by policymakers to advance personalized precision medicine is fueling the increased number of approved orphan therapy. As of August 2018, there were 503 approved orphan drug therapies with a total of 731 indications, including orphan drugs used to treat cancer, hemophilia, and related blood and genetic disorders. It's important to note that not all orphan drugs are specialty drugs, but many of them are. In fact, 87% of orphan drug spending falls within the specialty classification. Rare diseases or rare disease patients and their families, caregivers, and healthcare providers face unique challenges, and their clinical needs differ from those of patients with more common conditions, and their conditions are poorly, often poorly diagnosed and less well understood. These patients bear a large burden from the effects of their disease, as well as direct and indirect monetary costs and financial toxicity. Specialty pharmacy is the optimal pharmacy practice setting to help orphan disease patients and their families navigate the complexities of their disease, drug therapy, insurance coverage challenges, and financial barriers. There are three pharmacy channel strategies used for the distribution of orphan drugs open, limited, and exclusive. Each has its own advantages and challenges. Open networks are typically used for larger 
patient population disease states and drugs that have minimal safety concerns. This distribution method is ideal for medications that require little ongoing patient support and have limited hurdles to patient access. Open distribution mode does have its limitations. Because patients can obtain medications from more than one location, there are inherent inconsistencies in the patient experience. Aggregation and consistency of data collection are also challenging in this distribution model, as can be disruption in referral management and potential overuse of copay and quick start programs because of the multitude of players involved. Limited distribution provides a more consistent patient experience since there are fewer providers with whom patients can interact. Additionally, data access is more consistent and integration with hubs and data aggregators is easier and competition to be selected for a limited network drives innovation and enhanced quality of services provided. This channel also reduces distribution costs and simplifies inventory management because fewer dispensing locations are involved. The drawbacks, however, to this model include reduced channel diversification and network adequacy issues in payer participation and coverage. Exclusive distributions are exactly as they sound. The manufacturer partners with a single specialty pharmacy. And this model is very attractive for manufacturers because it allows for a consistent patient experience that is ideal for a strategic focus on a small patient population such as a rare orphan disease. These networks allow for greater supply chain control and increased data, vis data visibility as all of the information is maintained in one system. However, there are limitations as well of the exclusive distribution model, and those are consistent with the limited distribution model in that we see a reduced channel diversification and little or no patient or prescriber choice. As manufacturers are developing their orphan drug specialty pharmacy networks, there are inherent capabilities and competencies of a high-performing specialty pharmacy that they consider, including the superior reputation and commitment to clinical and service excellence of the specialty pharmacy, the experience and expertise of the clinical management team, ubiquitous state licensures and that independent third-party specialty pharmacy accreditation we've mentioned, and also highest patient satisfaction scores and partner feedback. So as we look to the future, there are several factors affecting the evolution of specialty pharmacy marketplace. Fortunately for us, innovation is robust. Medicine spending in the United States is shifting from traditional small molecules towards specialty medications, which again treat relatively few people with these chronic, complex, or rare diseases. We're seeing a wave of new specialty drug treatments for diseases that were traditionally treated with small molecule therapies, such as drugs for the treatment of Alzheimer's, asthma, allergy, Parkinson's disease, heart failure, and COPD. And it's important to note that many of these chronic disease, diseases have large patient populations. So this translates to a higher cost per patient, and it's a major concern for a lot of payers. Another trend is the late phase R&D pipeline remains robust and we will see a high number of new brand launches by the year 2021, with 40 to 45 innovative medication launches each year. And in the next five years, we're anticipating that oncology, autoimmune, and diabetes will drive the specialty pharmacy therapeutic growth. Medication adherence is at the core of the healthcare value equation and it impacts all stakeholders, including the patient, the pharmacy, the hospital, the physician, the insurer, and CMS as our nation's largest insurer. As we look to the future, it's important to remain cognizant of the healthcare delivery system trends, including we are approaching the tipping point of payer price sensitivity and the willingness to pay. Employers and consumers are stretching the boundaries of what is meaningfully different versus what is comparable as they both struggle with the rising cost of medications and healthcare. We're also seeing stricter payer utilization management strategies being employed. We see increased patient out-of-pocket liabilities, and we have an increased focus on drug pricing and transparency and a shift from the deep rebate model to the lowest net unit cost. Value-based contracting continues to be refined as payers want to contract not just on volume, but on the outcome of the medication. And they're looking to contract on value, and they want to share this financial responsibility with the manufacturer. 
We're also seeing more aggressive rare disease specialty drug benefit management and an emphasis on care coordination. There's also an increased focus on collecting and using data to modify behavior and improve health outcomes. Abandonment in affordability is still a major concern. Adherence and compliance is a challenge, but also an opportunity for specialty pharmacy. In fact, in 2015, 27% of specialty brand prescriptions were abandoned by patients during the deductible phase of their benefit. But patient noncompliance not only has a negative effect on the patient, but also to the entire healthcare delivery system, and to all of us as well, it translates into higher costs. It's important to remember that the most costly medication is the one that the patient doesn't take. As the administration and governmental agencies continue to focus on drug pricing, affordability, and transparency, the pharmacy industry will continue to be demanding, dynamic, and disruptive. Specialty pharmacy, though, is in a perfect position to enhance and tailor approaches to patient care, adapt their operational processes, and drive toward establishing standardization as the healthcare delivery model changes and evolves. And specialty pharmacy is the perfect partner for rare drug manufacturers and rare disease patients and their caregivers. Now I will turn it over to Michael Zaglinski to discuss his experience at Briova RX. Thank you very much, Sheila. And good afternoon or good morning to everybody today. I'm very happy to be able to share some information with you regarding specialty and infusion services that are offered by specialty pharmacies and infusion pharmacies. Sheila did an excellent job of highlighting the history of the specialty pharmacy industry, as well as talking about what the components of a specialty pharmaceutical are that makes it a specialty drug, and the different evolutions that have occurred with orphan drugs and the approval of more and more medications that have defined the industry. What I'd like to get into a little more specifics for everyone is what exactly does a specialty or infusion pharmacy do and what should you look at as a patient in your specialty or infusion pharmacy from a servicing perspective. So from the specialty pharmacy services side, uh, we are able to take a look at what has traditionally been provided by specialty pharmacies and what is provided today and in the future. Traditional specialty pharmacy has focused on looking at the cost of the drugs, what is on formulary, and what you may or may not be able to have approved by your insurance company or your PBM within your benefit plan. There have also been adherence programs, and you may have heard the term high-touch pharmacy when referring to specialty. As we've continued to evolve as specialty pharmacies, we now are looking for additional capabilities to make everybody's lives easier from a customer perspective, whether it is a patient, whether it is a provider, or whether it is the payer or pharma. So we look at additional things such as capabilities that the specialty pharmacy is providing. And one thing that I will stress and provide more information on in a little bit is that the specialty pharmacies should have specialties, subspecialties, within various disease states. So they should consist of therapy teams that are defined by the disease states and the drugs that are part of treating that disease state. Additionally, there should be connections that exist where the specialty pharmacy is not just dispensing or providing the medication, but also providing connections across the, the benefit that might exist within the pharmacy uh, from the PBM perspective, the pharmaceutical benefit manu uh, manager, or the medical plan. So if you have an insurer who is taking care of hospital charges or physician charges, making sure that there are connections being built across all of the benefits plans to make the experience of receiving this medication, taking the medication, administering it, and ultimately making sure that there are financial. And thirdly, looking at care, uh, looking at not just the medication that the specialty pharmacy is providing, but having insight into all the other medications that a person might be taking and assisting in other comorbidities or other diseases like diabetes, hypertension, 
or high cholesterol. The goal ultimately is to increase patient empowerment, make it a simpler process to get the specialty medication, and assure that people always have the medication and don't run out of their medication so that they could optimize being adherent to the medication. When we look at infusion services, infusion is a little bit different because infusion typically requires a nurse or a physician to administer the medication. Specialty pharmacy is typically oral medications taken by mouth or in, uh, injected medications a needle which is used to administer the medication subcutaneously or under your skin. When you look at infusion, this is typically a nurse or a physician who is accessing a vein and infusing the medication through the vein directly into your bloodstream. So this requires a higher uh, level of uh, administration. It involves the provider, the physician, much more. It also requires clinical expertise from the nurse or physician perspective while the drug is being administered to ensure that there are no side effects. Additionally, making sure that the infused drug, the site of care or where the drug is being administered is optimized. So that could be the patient's home, that could be in a standalone infusion suite, meaning a room that might be in a business's building or in a, uh, even in the infusion pharmacy. It could be in the doctor's office or it could be in the hospital. Ultimately, we like to see that the medication is infused at the site of care that is most convenient and cost effective for the patient and the payer, which typically is at home, an infusion suite, or the physician's office. So those are the differentiators that exist when the medication is infused. And more and more, as medications come to market and are approved by the FDA, we are seeing more drugs requiring infusion versus being taken orally or subcutaneously. Clinical support for people with rare diseases is vitally important. So your specialty pharmacy should be providing you with a team of people that are working with you to minimize disruption and maximize the ability to get the medication on time. Uh, they should have pharmacists, possibly nurses, and customer service people who are working with you and ultimately providing the care needed to ensure that you are taking the medication safely, effectively, and getting the benefit out of the, the medication. Frequently, questions will be asked to track how you are doing, how the medication is performing, are there any side effects, and providing support to help you work through that. Additionally, if there are other needs from a healthcare perspective, whether that might be working through a behavioral health provider or working directly with a physician or other types of healthcare providers, the specialty pharmacy should be able to help make those connections and optimize your benefit that exists between your medical benefit and your pharmacy benefit. These ultimately will lead to outcomes that we are looking for to see if people are responding positively to the medication and receiving the benefit that we expect. If we are not receiving the benefit, what we want to make sure we do is connect the whole team with the patient and work with the physician to determine if the medication should be changed to another medication and we should look for other alternatives. Uh, what we do not want to have happen is a patient continuing to take a medication at a very high cost, potentially has side effects, and not receiving the benefit that would be expected from it. So this entire care team that you see on the screen is what we are looking to ensure is provided as support from the specialty pharmacy directly to the patient to ensure that the results we're expecting will, will occur. 
Some of this is done, as I said, through home infusion. If the medication is infused by home nursing, nurses may actually take additional assessments in the home. Nurses may track those responses to those assessments over time and determine if the patient is actually receiving the benefit. For instance, a test that is easily administered is a walk test for people that might have neurological diseases. And what we're expecting is to measure that walk test over time, meaning how far a person can walk in a given time frame, and see if there is an improvement in that or if there's a deterioration in the walk over time so that we can see if the medication is having the result we want which is to slow disease progression or maybe improve uh, upon the disease and how it presents. So those are the types of things that a nurse may do in the home. Additionally, for people that do not have nurses in the home, technology should be provided by your specialty pharmacy that allow for better communication. For instance, using a, the video capabilities that we all have on our iPads, computers, or iPhones, to have a video conference with the pharmacist is beneficial. One of the things that can be done is if you are having an issue when injecting your medication is for the pharmacist to actually see where the medication is being injected. And one of the common adverse effects we see with injectable medications are injection site reactions. By having the pharmacist actually be able to see what the site looks like, if it's red, if there uh, is something else going on, maybe swelling, uh, the pharmacist can then offer additional solutions for those injection site reactions and also provide communication back to the physician. The standard patient journey in a specialty pharmacy uh, is listed here on this screen. So it starts from the time that the prescription is received from the provider. So whenever the prescription is received, frequently what happens first is to create a record in a computer system and then have a welcome call to the patient, which is essentially notifying the patient that the physician has provided a prescription order and that the order will be worked upon Maybe there is insurance clearance that has to be uh, done. There might have to be prior authorizations that have to be received. But notifying the patient from the beginning that there is a process, and as soon as different steps in the process are completed, then the delivery can be set up, and the, the drug can be either picked up at the specialty pharmacy, if that's an option, or most commonly, specialty pharmacies are shipping the medications directly to your home, to your business, to a doctor's office, or in another location as convenient for pickup. Afterwards, the pharmacist should be providing an initial conversation, consultation via a conversation that helps assess uh, where the patient is in the treatment of their disease. If they have been on the medication for years and simply are a new specialty pharmacy, the discussion might be shorter and the conversation will be to see if the medication has been working and to get a history. If the patient, however, is brand new to a medication, then the pharmacist consultation typically takes a little bit longer and is used to set the basis from which the care model will be set up for that patient going forward for that medication. As the drug is utilized, the pharmacy should be calling the patient regularly to obtain refill permission to provide the medication and ship it again. And then the pharmacist and or nurse will then pro be providing additional assessments and follow-up consultations. Some of these are required for certain drugs due to the side effect profiles. Uh, the FDA may have approved a program for the manufacturer that has to be followed for uh, assessment of the patient throughout the therapy in order to assure that the drug is not causing any harm. So some of the, uh, the assessments may be more frequent than others. Otherwise, the pharmacist may speak with the patient every three, six, uh, nine months. Afterwards, the ongoing support is being looked at to see if the patient is responding to the medication, if they are receiving the benefit that is expected, and to assure that any adherence issues are being mitigated 
uh, by the pharmacist in working with a patient and or providers or caregivers. What we really want to see is that the patient has essentially one care team and that they could go to that care team to help them. When you look at your insurance benefits, the benefit that is utilized the most by patients is the pharmacy benefit. That's where the most touch points occur in the healthcare system. So as pharmacists, we want to make sure that we are providing connections, closing any gaps that there might be. Maybe there's other medications that somebody should be on and assuring that uh, the education of the patient on their disease and the medications is occurring. So the example that is shown here is Molly, who is diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And the concierge team, there should be a team of people who are focused on Molly, who are very knowledgeable of cystic fibrosis, understand the medications, understand the disease, and ultimately understand Molly and what she's going through personally. It's important to customize what we do to the patient by understanding what she is going through and looking for different opportunities through pharmacist consultations. Uh, if she has diabetes and her insurance company offers a diabetes care program, uh, making sure that she knows about that and referring her to that care program. And also, what may be common with many of these diseases, uh, people develop depression. So making sure that there are assessments being done periodically to check to see if Molly is exhibiting signs of depression and helping her get the treatment that she may need or uh, the therapy by talking to a therapist, for instance. The solutions that the therapy team uh, provides then is to make sure that uh, Molly is not having any drug-to-drug -drug interactions with anything else that she's taking. There may be opportunities for her to save money by coordinating her medications differently and finding lower cost options. And if she does have a benefit that allows her to receive a 90-day supply from home delivery, then offering that uh, to her so that she could save money on her co-pays by getting a 90-day versus a 30-day supply on her other medications. If she has access to a nurse and getting her enrolled in a care management program, many insurance companies have these for things like diabetes or cardiac diseases. And specifically, if she is showing depression signs, making sure that we connect her with a behavioral coach that may be available from her insurance company. This last example here is uh, another patient, Anne, and she happens to have hereditary angioedema. Now, she had a recent history of a heart attack, and whenever the pharmacist is calling her to talk to her about her medication, finds out that she has not uh, been put on a beta blocker, which is important for somebody who has had a heart attack. So by looking through her medication profile, understanding what she has gone through with the heart attack episode, Simply offering a low-cost beta blocker, working and coordinating that with her physician, can help reduce the risk of a second heart attack for Anne and also save her and her insurance company money from the cost of an episode of care. You know, a heart attack may cost around $40,000 per episode and also create significant health risk for Anne. So we want to make sure that if there are drugs that should be added due to various risk profiles or other diseases that Anne has, that the pharmacist is talking to her about that. So with that, I hope I gave you some information on what to expect and uh, ask for from a specialty pharmacy or an infusion pharmacy. And at this point, Sheila and I will be happy to answer the questions that we've been seeing popping up in the chat section on, uh, on the screen. So I'll turn it over to our chairperson at this point. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Sheila, for your great presentation. Um, we have received a number of great, great questions that we will go through. Um, if you have any questions, please remember to submit them in the chat box. Um, we will try and answer as many questions as possible. If for whatever reason we don't get to your question, please email us at educationatrarediseases.org and someone will follow up with you. Um, so, Michael, I will start with you. Um, 
We have a question here. My current insurance policy pays for my infusions through its medical policy, but I'm about to go on Medicare. How do specialty pharmacies work with Medicare to provide coverage and access to care? So that's a very good question. Anytime you have an insurance change, it is very important for you to have that discussion with your infusion provider, whoever is providing that infusion. Specialty pharmacies are able in certain instances to bill Medicare for some infusions, but it's very limited. So in the case, uh, and not knowing your particular history, the drug that you are on, the disease that you have, uh, the most important thing would be to talk to your specialty or infusion pharmacy, determine if they're able to continue to provide it. And if not, there may need to be a transition to a physician's office, uh, an infusion suite, somewhere where the billing to Medicare can occur for your infusion. And Michael, this is Sheila. I, oh, okay. I, w I just wanted to add as well, it may be um, beneficial for the beneficiary to reach out to their, you know, the, the Medicare plan that they're, they're transitioning to because, you know, I'm a former pharmacy director for a health plan, and we like patients to receive as much as they could in their home, right? It, it was the best site of service for a lot of our patients. So they may be willing to, to work with you as well and, and find some solutions so that you can continue to receive that in your home. Great. Um, Sheila, I actually have a question for you. Um, how can someone find a specialty pharmacy in their state? Um, how can they contact a person working at a specialty pharmacy? Is there a database or, or some information about the list of, of um, you know, available pharmacies in a particular state or city? Right. So, um, Chica, that's a great question as well, and folks could always reach out to me. I'd be happy to to help them. We maintain a list of our member pharmacies, but that's not inclusive of all specialty pharmacies. They also may want to reach out to their um, insurance company, and they can often provide, you know, a list of medications that are in their network um, and help direct them that way. And then most of these specialty pharmacies, if not all, have a website with all of the contact information um, listed. So once you find out the name and identify the pharmacy, in your state or your geographical area, you would be able to, um, you know, just Google it or, or look up their website and find that contact information. Great. Um, and we'll make sure that we provide your information in your uh, organization's website so that people have that available. Um, how is, are insurance companies um, allowed to require or to make a specific requirement to use their particular specialty pharmacy. Let's say they have um, specialty pharmacies as a part of their um, company's business options. Is it, is it legal to require that you use their particular pharmacy or is the choice yours as the patient? So the insurance company works as a representative of whoever ultimately is paying for it. So let's take an employer. If my employer hires an insurance company to offer the benefit for, you know, pharmacy benefits or medical benefits for their, their employees, then the decision of whether they limit the specialty pharmacies, whether that is to the specialty pharmacy that is part of the PBM or the insurance company, or if they choose another one that is not part of it, that is the decision of the employer as they are going through the selection of, uh, of an insurance company. Mm -hmm. So the, it, it is ultimately up to who is paying for uh, the medications to make the decision whether it is locked into a certain pharmacy or not. Got it. Okay, very helpful. Um, we have a question here. Is compounding done in specialty pharmacies? Uh, yes. So compounding is done in some specialty pharmacies. Compounding is typically involved with infused medications, but there are also some other compounding uh, compounders that will produce medications that are delivered to hospitals for administration in hospitals. 
Compounding is a very highly regulated area of pharmacy. So there are certain pharmacies that have to meet requirements set out by the FDA and other organizations in order to compound and ensure that the compounds are done in a sterile environment and that they are done uh, safely and effectively for patients. So not all specialty pharmacies will compound, but most home infusion pharmacies and standalone compounding pharmacies uh, obviously will do that. Got it. Okay. Um, this is a good question for everyone to know. Um, what can patients do if there's a shortage of a needed medication? I, I think you may have touched on this a little bit, Michael, during your presentation. Sure. So shortages are something that happen in the pharmaceutical industry uh, on a regular basis, unfortunately. Uh, depending on how the medication is manufactured, there are maybe supply issues, uh, our medications that we receive in this country are not all produced in this country. So some of them come from other countries and the pharmaceutical companies may have varying issues with supply based upon how they're manufactured. In specialty pharmacy, we use a lot of what is called biological medications which have to be produced in very complicated methods. We also have medications that are created uh, from blood donations and components of the blood are separated out. Uh, for instance, uh, used to be before some of the newer products, hemophilia factors would be provided uh, from blood donations. But most importantly, intravenous immune globulin is one that is typically uh, Com it comes from blood and that we have seen shortages of because if there are interruptions in the blood supply and donations, then manufacturers have shortages. So to answer the question, what can you do? It is to be very knowledgeable of the medication you receive, uh, do as much you know, questioning and research of your specialty pharmacy, your physician, uh, Google online the medication, and work with your physician and pharmacist in advance to say, okay, have there been shortages of this medication? And if there are, what are my options if the medication is no longer available? Sheila, I think that you have uh, some experience as well as a national organization in advising too. Yes, we can often um, times, you know, reach out to some of our wholesaler and distributor friends who may be able to secure the product and, you know, help the patient um, obtain the medication during periods of shortage, which can be trying for everybody. So, Absolutely, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, and, and we will do all we can to connect you with the right folks. Great. Um, I actually have a very interesting question here uh, for you, Michael. Um, you mentioned the number of additional care and support services. Um, someone has mentioned that they have never had that experience with their specialty pharmacy and wanted to know if different specialty pharmacies offer different, um, different types of services um, and, and whether some don't offer some of the services that you mentioned? That's a very good question. You know, as specialty pharmacies and, you know, those that are part of uh, Sheila's organization, we all try to do our best and to differentiate ourselves from each other and compete with each other and, you know, we ultimately want to provide the best service. But there will be variations in service uh, just like you will see in any other business. So if you look at Home Depot or Lowe's, for instance, they're both you know, providing um, you know, home, home repairs and, and different types of things uh, for lawn and garden. But if you go to each, there's going to be you know, differences between the two and how they service their uh, customers that come in. Same for us. Not all specialty pharmacies offer everything. But the components that I mentioned are the ones that are the newer ones that uh, I would recommend that you look for. And if, you know, for instance, you are looking for the opportunity to do things more digitally, then making sure that your specialty pharmacy, you talk to them about ways in which you can uh, do more of your refills and things online and uh, have it suit your life better for what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, Sheila, I have a question that I think um, is best suited for you. What's the best way to establish a connection between an insurance company and a specialty pharmacy um, when the insurer's website doesn't make it clear? And so I, I think, Sheikha, this is coming from somebody who is trying to um, become perhaps participating with an insurance company. So what I used to always tell folks when I was at, you know, the health plan, people would call and want to be part of my specialty pharmacy network, and so I would send them out the list of criteria that we require, right? We were very diligent in selecting the, the highest performing specialty pharmacies to, to take care of our members. So I would recommend just reaching out to that insurance company. Just because it's not listed on their website doesn't mean that they aren't under obligation or that they won't furnish it to you. So I would just explain that either, A, you know, I have a pharmacy and I want to be part of the network, or if you're, you know, a member of that insurance company and you want to use a particular pharmacy, speak to them about that. Um, because as, you know, the last question reflected, you know, the specialty pharmacies all have different capabilities in, in areas that they, um, you know, specialize in. And so, you know, the members are, are the number one customers of an insurance company. So if they're not happy or they want to see something different, speaking up often is, is the way to get that, that ball rolling. Sure. Yeah, there, there's nothing like picking up the phone, right, <laughs> and just giving, giving someone a call. Um, okay, thank you. How... How do specialty pharmacies work with patients that live in parts of the country where Internet access um, is, is limited or unavailable um, or the cost is prohibitive? So I think this is for you, Michael. I think you touched on some of the, um, some of the options where you can connect with the care team um, via your computer and whatnot. So, um, what happens if there are issues with access, whether um, it's Internet access or, or maybe um, smartphone um, limitations? Very good question. You know, we have people we deal with all across the country in very remote areas of Alaska, for instance, and the, you're right. The, the technology, the ability to connect on the Internet, uh, having uh, the financial means to have a cell phone and maintain the service every month, it's not easy for everybody. So what we do is we offer all sorts of opportunities and ways in which to stay in touch with a specialty pharmacy. There's nothing like snail mail to mail things back and forth. I think we keep the fax machine industry in business uh, between us and physicians, so faxing, if that's a capability, is always a possibility that doesn't require the Internet. Um, we always do phone calls, so it could be a phone call to a landline. Uh, all of that is, does not require the Internet and it doesn't require a smartphone. If, however, people have the capabilities and live in areas where high-speed access is available, then we offer those as well for those people. So it's important to meet people where they're at and not force them into a solution to work with a specialty pharmacy uh, because they may not be able to communicate the way that uh, you know, they're being asked to. So we, we have to adjust for the patient. Sure. Um, very good question here and timely about um, stem cell and gene therapy and how um, the specialty pharmacy industry is preparing um, and, and if you will be um, involved in dispensing those therapies. Sheila, you want to take that first? Well, sure. Um, you know, Part of, you know, I, I also have a part-time job, and I work for a local insurer working on some, you know, new, new drugs and new therapies that are being approved and some policy criteria. So I think with a, a lot of the gene therapies and um, the, the newer innovative products, um, a lot of them are being handled right now by the, either the hospital or the health system where it's going to be administered. But I definitely see a role for specialty pharmacy as this continues to evolve and we move towards more personalized and precision medicine. And I think, you know, the specialty pharmacist will be able to serve as a resource and help prescribers navigate, um, you know, all of the nuances of insurance coverage and what's covered and what's not and what's appropriate for a patient based on their genetic makeup and their testing results. 
Um, and then I can, you know, see as more and more of these therapies come to market, specialty pharmacy may be involved with, you know, the, the handling and the dispensing or the furnishing to the, um, the physician who's going to administer it. So I, I think this is, you know, new ground for us, and it's, um, it's going to be really interesting as things continue to evolve. Michael, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, that was well said, Sheila. So what I would add is that gene therapy is personalized. It's manufactured or created specifically for that patient, and it will not be a medication that's stored on a shelf like the medications we have today. So I believe, as Sheila said, there will be opportunities for specialty pharmacists to work uh, within gene therapy in the future, but it will certainly be different than how we're operating today. Great. So one, one more minute, let's try and get one more question in. Um, uh, there's a question about the differences between the services that drug manufacturers provide through their patient services programs and the services that specialty pharmacies provide. So uh, a pharmaceutical company may hire an outside company called a hub to help uh, physicians navigate through the system and to get their patients on the medication. Typically what the hubs will do is serve as patient education. They will help the physicians with information needed for prior offs or to get the insurance covered and also assure that um, the patient has the ability and access financially to the medication. Uh, we work regularly with hubs and uh, I would say in a more complementary fashion. Some of the work is still done in the pharmacy such as insurance coverage and clearance but we regularly work and complement what is being done by the manufacturer through the hub uh, versus what we are doing with a specialty pharmacy. Typically, the hub will be involved at the very beginning when the patient starts the medication and then uh, may not be involved again. The specialty pharmacy is involved throughout the course of treatment. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your wonderful presentations and for tackling all these questions. If we didn't get to your question, um, please feel free to email us at education at rarediseases.org and someone will follow up with you. After the webinar, you'll receive a short survey. Please do fill it out. Um, we encourage you to do that because it does help us develop future webinars and your feedback is very important to us. Lastly, thanks so much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you.